Dear God, thank you for bringing us together to look at what you tell us tonight about the role of the men and women that you have established in your word. Um, we also bring tonight some requests before you. Um, we ask you to be with, with Kathy's family and in the family of her step grandson who has passed away. Um, you know, sin is an awful thing and it, and it leads to death and it is a part of this world and we don't always know why um, you allow it to happen, but we trust it is in your good plan that you let these things happen. So please comfort that family with your word, give them assurance and use this as an opportunity to strengthen them in their trust in you. And Heavenly Father, we also ask for, for Kirby, um, one of Marilyn's friends who is going through a tough time right now in her in her young marriage and um, it looks like they might be going through some separation, but we ask, Lord, that you work your will and you guide them to, to see what marriage is supposed to be according to you and how they can love each other and serve each other and hopefully fix this marriage because it is a wonderful gift that you have given them. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So to start, any questions from last time? And I believe last time, at least most of us are here, was chapter 8. But if it's not chapter 8, two, totally fine. It can be anything we've gone over that you're thinking of. All right, not seeing questions, so let's get into chapter 10 then. So we're, we're talking about chapter 10, the role of men and women, um, starting on page 53. We're going to look at what God's word tells us about that tonight. Um, so marriage is a gift from God that has roles given as, as a part of it for the man and the woman that God tells us about. Um, you know, it was a gift before sin was in the world with Adam and Eve when they were created. God instituted marriage between them, the first man and the first woman, before there was sin. Um, but the problem now with marriage is still a gift from God, but we have sinful people now that are a part of it. And when you take one sinful person and unite them with another sinful person, there's going to be a lot more sin that happens. Sinning against someone um, that you know very closely. Um, I've heard it said that the person you're going to sin against most in your life is your spouse. Um, because you know the ways to get at them the most, and you know that's the person you have the most contact with. And because we're sinful, that's what happens. And so we need to look today, what does God tell us about marriage? How are we supposed to live in that relationship? Not in a sinful way, but in a way that's pleasing to God and respecting that gift of marriage. Um, so yeah, we're going to look first at God's will regarding marriage. So God instituted marriage. I'm going to read this longer section first, pausing every once in a while to talk about different things that get brought up. So Genesis 2, 18 through 24, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So with creation, every day God created something. He's always said it was good. But now after he creates man, he says it is not good. But notice he's not saying the man isn't good. The man was perfect. His creation was perfect. But he's saying the problem is, is that he's alone. That, that's, that's a problem that needs to be fixed. And so God says, I'm going to make a helper suitable for him. You know, he doesn't say, I'm going to make an exact carbon copy that can be the exact same as him to help him. He says, a helper, someone that's going to complement him. So there's going to be different strengths, different weaknesses that, that fit together well. Not to something that just, you know, is the exact same, like two squares, but it's something that fits together and works well together. All right, starting at verse 19 again. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all of the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So you might think to yourself, why does God bring up naming the animals right after he talks about getting helper for the man? So God obviously saw the problem, that there wasn't a, a partner for the man. And God, you know, lovingly wants to show Adam this problem too and get him to realize it on his own. And so he has Adam name all these animals and when it gets down to the end of it, you know, it says, but for Adam, no suitable helper is found. He realizes all these animals have, have pairs and, 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 you know, some someone of their own species to be with, and there's no one here for me. There's no helper. And so God is showing Adam what this, what what's missing here and how he's going to fix it soon. Yeah, Dennis. So why would he uh, create male and female of all the animals and not man right away? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, or did he? When he saw the issue with uh, uh, Adam, he did the same for uh, the animals. Yeah, well, I definitely think that, you know, obviously God is omnipotent, so he knows everything. So it's not like this problem surprised him, you know. So he obviously always knew what he was going to do here. And so, you know, the narrative is obviously written from a human's point of view in time of how, how we see these things happening. Um, and so 
yeah, I, I guess I can't give you a reason why God chose to do it this way, but we do know that God did do it this way. And it was on the same day that this happened. It wasn't like it was a huge span of time um, that was like slow realization. It, it was the day of that he realizes this. Yeah. You follow? I think that there's a greater importance of why he did it that way. Because it's the, the connection between man and woman and how they to be one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to see, too, the way that God makes woman uh, is, is important and, and symbolical. So, you know, that's probably also part of the intention of why it was, you know, done the way yeah. it did it. The importance of how we're supposed to see each other as one, not separate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So picking back up at 21, that's what we're going to get to here. Um, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place of flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of man, and he brought her to the man. So when God made man, he did it different than the rest of creation. With everything else, he says, just with his voice, let there be, and it was so. With everything else. But with man, we know he, it was an intimate creation. He made man out of the dust, formed him with, with his own hands in a special way, different from the rest of creation. And now we see with woman, he takes that same care, that, that same intimate creating when he makes the woman. And he takes takes the rib from the man, makes her from that rib, and shows, you know, first of all, special creation again. And second of all, um, you know, it's a part of him. They are one. Man and wife are one. And, you know, that's part of, for that that first couple, physically, they were one, from made from the same flesh. And um, St. Augustine has a quote about, you know, the sim sim symbolism with it being a rib. Um, he says, woman wasn't made from the head of man so that she could top him. Uh, woman, woman wasn't made from the heel of man so that he could trample her. She was made from the side of man so that he, she could always be by his side and be protected and support him always by his side. And so we see, you know, there's there's also some symbolism there with, with being made from the rib of man too. So it's a special creation. And now Adam replies about this and, and acknowledges how special it is. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. And now God speaks here, giving some comments on about marriage. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. So first of all, a man will leave his father and mother. That's not to say you write off your parents and go, you know, never talk to them again and get married. I call my parents probably weekly still and I'm married, and I'm glad I have that relationship still. But the point is, is that that primary relationship in your life is no longer you know, your parents and you, but it's your spouse and you. That's what it becomes a primary relationship in your life now. And be united. So the Hebrew word used here was also used in regard to welding metal together. And, you know, when something's welded really, welded really well, I guess, you know, it's, it's so seamless. Sometimes you can't even really tell where it was welded. And it's strong. You can't break it. You can't break it back off at the point it was welded. You can separate it but it's not going to be the same way it was before they were welded. And so God is saying here, that super tight unity, you become a unit now together. And he drives at home with saying, and they will become one flesh. And, you know, it's it, that's talking about a physical connection as well as a spiritual and relational connection. You are no longer one on your own, but you are now become one with your spouse. And so we see with the essence of marriage and, and is commitment, um, talking about verse 24 that we just read, um, kind of brought it up. So it's commitment by leaving other relationships, commitment to joining together as that one unit, and commitment to growing in a lifetime of unity with that spouse. So marriage is joining of one man and one woman. That is God's plan. Man's contrary plans are in violation of God's will. So I'm going to pause there. Any questions so far on that first section in, uh, from Genesis? All right. Okay. So now we see how there are violations to what God's God's plan is. Um, you know, the government doesn't always follow God's will. Um, what the government does or calls marriage, though legally, doesn't change what God tells us here about marriage. So that's where keep, what does God tell us? And no matter what other people say, it doesn't change what God tells us. So Mark 10, verse 8, at the bottom of page 53. Marilyn, you want to read that for us? And the two will become one flesh, so they are no longer two, but one. Yeah, so driving to the point. It's no longer two people, but it's one people. That is God's definition of marriage. Um, so now, now we look at the purposes and blessings of marriage. 
Um, and there are three main things that we bring up um, that are blessings from marriage. First of all, companionship, you know, just the relation. You have someone that you're very close with now. You you have someone, you're not alone. You build a relationship now. Number two is children. Um, Genesis 128. Kathy, you want to read that one? Yes. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Go over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over every living creature that moves on ground. Yeah, so God is, is telling them, be fruitful, have kids, multiply, grow in your numbers. Um, he said that to Adam and Eve uh, as their, their instruction to have children. Um, and it's not saying that a marriage isn't a marriage if there's not children there. You know, obviously, sometimes there's infertility that prevents that. Um, but what God is saying is where there are children, it's his design that they are in a marriage, that they are children of a married man and wife. And we know because of sin, sadly, that's not always the case. Sometimes there are single parents just as a result of the world that we live in. Um, but in those cases, what's important is that we realize how important of a job it is to raise a kid and how hard that is. And, you know, that's those are the times when we need, we need to give extra support, extra care to those single parents to help them to, you know, fill the void that's left because of sin when one of the parents is out of the picture. Yeah. And also number three, a blessing of marriage is that it helps us avoid immorality. Um, it used to be when I, when I was growing up, I was taught about the three C's, and we call this last one, which you know is, is referring to sexual relations in the right way, in the in the good way. And so, you know, God tells us it's between the man and wife. That's who the, who it's between. And you know, when you do that, you avoid sexual immorality. You avoid committing adultery, going after other people. Deborah, do you want to read First Corinthians seven for us? Sure. Um, but since there is so much immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. Yeah, so so God, so this letter written to the Corinthians um, was written to the, the people in the town of Corinth, and Corinth was almost like the Vegas of, of that day. It was just known for its debauchery, um, worship that involved, you know, temple prostitutes and, and all sorts of just awful things. And so Paul's writing to these people who are living in the midst of that, saying, God wants you to only have one one spouse. And, you know, having a sex drive isn't a bad thing. It's part of that blessing in marriage that God gives us. But, of course, the devil is going to try to work in us to take advantage of that gift and to twist it. And so when we are married, we get to practice that gift in a God-pleasing way. All right. God. What were the other two C's? You said there were three C's. Yeah. There was one of them. What are the other two? Companionship and children. Sorry. Yeah. So, yeah, numbers one and two. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, I, that, that's always helped me remember because it's kind of catchy, you know, three C's. Um, but, yeah, that helps you remember it. That's great. All right. God's definition of love now. Um, we're going to see with a lot of these passages um, what, how does God use the word love? You know, you can use the love, the word love, in a bunch of different ways. If I say, I love pizza, I love the Braves, I love my wife. That's, you know, each of those sayings means something a little bit different to it. Now, those loves aren't all exactly the same. And so we're going to see, what is God's definition of love? What does he mean? Starting with John 3.16. Dennis, go ahead and read that for us. For God so loved the world that he gave him his one and only son, that his wife believes in him, shall not perish, but have eternal life. Yeah. What was God's love? A sacrifice, sacrificing his own son, giving that up for us. That is his demonstration of what love is. Romans 5 8, Frida. Mm -hmm. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Yeah, so bring up again the sacrifice. Christ died for us. But we get this part added on to it now. You know, when did God act on his love? Was it when we were really good and really deserved it at that point? No, it was, if, if God waited for that moment, we never would have had Christ come to earth. But it was while we were still sinners, while we, was, we were still, you know, dead in sin to God, he chose to give us that sacrifice and act in love, even though we couldn't give anything back. John 15, 13, Jacob, go ahead and read that one. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Yeah, so now God is building on this even more. That sacrificial love, that is the greatest form of love that you can show. That is... Yeah, the best way that you can show love is by sacrifice. All right, Sylvester, um, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. Go ahead and read that, that longer section for us. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast. It is not power, it is not a it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angry. 
It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but it reveals the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always preserves. Love nor fails, but there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is not much, they will be taken pass away. Yeah, thank you. So you notice how difficult um, doing those things actually is. You know, love is patient. How often do I run out of patience at home with, with you know, the stupidest little things? Um, you know, at the at the fast food food restaurant, if I get told I have to pull my car up and wait a little bit longer, you know, how quick am I to get angry about that? It's supposed to be fast food, right? And I have to wait. My patient runs out quickly. You know, love is always kind. It doesn't boast. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not looking to get something in return. How often do I do something thinking, you know, oh, I bet this person will, you know, do something back for me now that I did that. And, you know, probably the hardest here when it says it keeps no records of wrong, of wrongs. That's especially tough to remember, you know, to, to not keep those things held against each other. And when I read this list, we have to remember, no one can do this perfectly and show us love perfectly. But thank goodness that we had Jesus do it for it for us when he lived and died. And now we need to strive to follow that love. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> On that particular spot. Okay. Where it says, uh, doesn't keep the record of no love about wrong feelings, right? Yeah. Well, what about David? What about all the people in the Old Testament where they did wrong? There's a record of it. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, God is obviously the saying to give someone else saying, come back. Crease my in there is because it brought it was uh, he forgave them yeah and, and and they flourished as a result of his forgiveness for them yeah so in that regard we, uh the record of their wrongdoing was still to glorify him not to punish them yeah exactly so there is a physical a physical record of it where we have stories you know what's the purpose behind those records it's not to show us you know Hate these people because they're sinful, but it's to show greater glory to God and to show that even though all these things happen, God in his eyes doesn't keep record of that because Jesus paid even for all those sins that we see as examples. And that's particularly why I love reading stuff in the Old Testament because you get a lot of those real life examples of real life people that you can really relate to. Um, and so, yeah, you get to see if God, you know, God doesn't keep track of those people wrong, he forgives them. And that's the same for me, too. He doesn't keep track of my wrongs, either. He forgives everything I do wrong, too. Yeah, that is. Okay, sure. So I've, I've been at church once when the pastor, you made it like a question. And when you made it like a question, I gave an answer. And he said, yeah, God forg uh, uh, forgives and forgets. I said, no, God never forgets. Because if he forgets, and that makes that period of time that didn't exist. And God doesn't forget. And then they brought up the point where it's uh, where it says that uh, oh, he remembers not, and that's not the same as as uh, forgetting. And I gave them an example of that. And I can, I'll share this with you. In your own mind, think think of something when you were a little kid that made you laugh real hard. I don't care what it is, but I just brought that to your memory. What God is saying is that there's no one that can come before me and remind me of something you did wrong. It's never going to happen. Doesn't mean he completely forgot, but it does mean that someone's going to be able to bring it up to, to them. Yeah, that that almost shows more glory to the fact that you know God does know everything, but the fact that he still remembers, but he still chooses to not keep record of it and to to count it against us. You know, that's right. that's, that's the amazing glory of God. It's not like he just forgets about it, but he still chooses to forgive it every time. Yeah. All right. So now we're going to look at the, the, so I guess, any other questions through that point now before we get into the rules? Um, yeah, you know, you had me read, for God so loved the world. We kind of, uh, kind of pass over where it says God so loved the world. It shouldn't be a little S, it should be a big S. God so loved the world. And what he's saying there is that he, he has such admiration for all of us that he would do that for us. Yeah. And that kind of gets lost in that. Yeah, yeah, and it's, yeah, absolutely, yeah. All right, so I'm going to do a quick recap for Helen here just to get you caught back up to speed. Do, do I need to write, I will not be late to Bible class? Apologize, I didn't know my husband was going to say it's date night. So, oh, yeah, that's all right. Well, <laughs> you know, that's, I, you were I was going to get on the Zoom thing 
and he had me at Los Charos, and I was afraid y'all hearing all these people in the restaurant when I was leaving. But so disconnected, the next thing I know, he's calling me going. Our <laughs> <laughs> so, so the Ferrari is still is still your box up there, but it says so Becky. So I was like. What's going on? And so my husband was like, I'll get you to class and I'm sorry. Like me. That's what's going on, Alan. It's good to carry out, you know, well, we're talking about marriage things. So you're just doing, doing, like, doing the right thing. Yeah. So just to catch up quick, we talked about God started marriage at creation when he made woman from man as his helper, not an exact copy, but something that was going to be, you know, a fit for him to help match his strengths and weaknesses. Um, he made a woman from man, from his rib, to be, you know, someone who's with him for life. And we see that in marriage, you leave your parents to be united as a new unit with your wife. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a lifelong commitment that we have, too. Um, any, anything that goes contrary to what God says about marriage, you know, that goes against God. Even if the government defines another definition for marriage, if it doesn't match what God says, that's not marriage in God's eyes. Um, and so, yeah, we see that. Two people become one flesh, they become one together. Um, oh, trust me. To me, marriage is this definition. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to keep my opinions that tucked away in my living room with that other. <laughs> All right, yeah. So then we, we jump from definition of marriage over to purposes and blessings. Talking about companionship is one, just being in a relationship. Children, God blesses marriages with children and it doesn't mean that you don't have children in a marriage that's not a real marriage. You know, sometimes there's infertility, but what God is saying that if there are children, his design is that it is within a marriage. Um, and we also see that in uh, marriage, you get to practice, you know, God pleasing sexual relationship. You're not sleeping around with other people, but you have that one person that God has given to you with that gift of sexual intimacy. And then we just look at God's definition of love, seeing how his definition is complete sacrifice. That is the greatest way that you can show love. And God showed that to us by giving his son. And now we try to imitate that every day um, in the lives that we live here on earth. All right. So now roles of husband and what uh, husbands and wives. Once again, re re reminding they are complements of each other, not copies. So there's going to be different roles that fit together um, for a man and for a wife. Um, so now God tells us how a man and, and wife show that sacrificial love. And keep in mind, too, that these roles are going to be oftentimes a lot different from what the world tries to say these roles should be or how they define these roles. And so we need to look at what does God say? So first passage, Ephesians 5, verse 21. Cassandra, do you want to read that one for us? Sure. Um, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Yes. So in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul's talking about a lot of different relationships, um, out, not even marriage relationships, but relationships with children and parents, with slaves and masters, those relationships where there's obviously a leader role and, you know, a, someone under the leader role. And he's saying here, you submit to, to one another, to, to those leadership roles, not because they're so good, not because they're so perfect at their position, but because of reverence for Christ and out of, to show respect and thanks to Christ. So that's what we keep in mind as we jump into this. So husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. Christ was never domineering or manipulating toward the church. And so now we're going back to Ephesians 5, where Paul draws the picture out, um, comparing Christ and the church to a husband and a wife. Marilyn, you want to read that first passage there, Ephesians 25? Sure. <clears throat> husbands love their wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Yeah. So what did Christ do for the church? You know, Christ made the church better. Christ lifted up the church, made the church perfect with his blood. And so when, when Christ tells the husband to love their wives in the same ways, just as Christ loves the church, he's telling them, you know, do everything you can in sacrificial love to lift up your spouse, to make them better, to, to support them and to encourage them and to, and to grow them. You know, obviously it doesn't make any sense to not love your body. So logically, husbands, why would you not love your wife who is a part of your body, who is a part of your unit now? You know, love her in the same exact way that you love your own physical body. That's what Christ did because 
you know, Christ describes himself as the head of the church, which is his body. He loves the body that much. So follow that example still. Dennis. I, um, I see it more in that you know, Christ died for the church, mm -hmm. for the church to flourish. And same thing, I think when it is saying that the husband should be willing to do that for their wives, if that's what it takes. It, uh, I told my wife a long time ago mm -hmm. that I'm not going to argue with you about something I don't agree with you about. That doesn't mean I'm not, I, that I'm going to agree with you, but I will stand by your side all the way till you see, even if it means we lose everything, you know, to my death. I love you. Yeah. And I want you to uh, flourish as a result. And that's that really changed my wife's attitude mm -hmm. on a lot of issues. And she, it, it actually brought us together to discuss things more. So she, she trusts that uh, my uh, intent is her. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's being willing, yeah, to give up everything, even up to the point of a life to to show that love. Yeah, and that's, that's you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, what that selfless love on both sides results in and those kind of positive blessings. Yeah. All right, Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8. I can read this one. I can't take what I've read yet. Um, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance of him as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. You know, the husband's role of, of you know, loving like Christ, loving in that leading way, is not always going to be glorious and you know and honorable. It's it's going to be humbling and, and humbling. The husband husband needs to humble himself to serve. You know, Christ our God made himself nothing. He made himself a servant, a human to come save us. So husband, in the same way, once again, humble yourself. Be willing to to give up yourself completely to love your wife. Um, it's not always going to be bold and noble, but it's going to be that humble service. And notice here too with these two passages talking about the husband's role. It's not saying, wives, make sure your husband does this, but it's saying God is speaking to the husband. And he's telling him, this is what you ought to do. Um, so yeah, we get we get our instructions from God. Um, that's how the role is going to be. And we're going to see the flip side for, for wives too. It's not going to say, husbands, make sure your wives are doing this and, and be critical of them. It's God is speaking straight to the wives here and telling them, this is the role that you're going to carry out now too. All right. So, so we get the role of the wife now on the top of page 55. Wives are to obey their husbands. Um, so this is back in Ephesians 5 again. We're going back to that same chapter. Kathy, you want to read that passage for us? Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also the wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Yeah. You know, what would happen if I took just that first passage, Ephesians 5.22, wives submit to your husbands, and I put that up on a billboard and put my phone number on there and say, call me if you want to talk about this. <laughs> Probably wouldn't be very good, right? And so that's why we look at the rest of the passage, obviously, in its context, you know. Um, and, and, you know, this is number one. This is God talking here. This isn't something I'm saying to you guys. We're looking at God's word here and seeing this is what God says. So let's see all of what he says in, in respect to this. Um, and once again, we're not talking about as the world treats leadership. A lot of time the world treats leadership as domineering, um, you know, just doing whatever you can to, to, be, to be more powerful. We remember that the way God talked about leadership is sacrificial. So let's keep that in mind as we pick apart this passage here. Um, so first of all, submit to your husbands. Once again, not because they're so good, not because they're perfect at being a leader every single time, but you do it as to the Lord. You know, what is the church willing to give up to submit to the Lord? you know, anything for their savior, right? And and so in the same way, Christ is saying, you know, wives, when your husband's in the role of your husband, I want you to be willing to give up anything to help him and show that selfless service that the church shows to me. Notice it doesn't say wives love your husbands. Yeah. <laughs> it does yeah. say husbands love your wives, but it doesn't say wives love your husbands. Yeah, and, and you know, obviously we hope that that love comes from it, but, you know, it's, it's that self, the, the focus of this chapter is the selflessness back and forth the, from the husband, the selfless love, from the wife, and the selfless submission. Um, and so pick up at 23. So the husband is the head of the wife, comparing it again to Christ as the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. 
So once again, this is where our model comes from. It's Christ and the church. That's what we compare the relationship of husband and wife. Um, so now the church submits to Christ. But also wives should submit to their husbands and everything. And once again, Satan is going to try to change these words and try to trick us into resenting doing these things, resenting fulfilling the roles that God sets out for us. But that's why we keep coming back to these passages when, you know, we have doubts about it and when we need to be reminded, what does God tell us? And we go back to what God says to remind us of these roles. And finally, we see Dennis before we move on. Yeah. You know, uh, going back to like what it says, submit unto your, you know, your husband's in the church, submit unto uh, Christ. Well, for the most part, you look at the church today. How much do they really submit to the Christ? Yeah. And for the for the husband, when you see that, if he's the head of the household and he's got this gray in his household, what is he doing wrong to show them how, how they're treating God? And that's why it's so important to be the head of the household in the right manner to teach everybody how we should treat the Lord. Exactly. So she's going to learn to treat him the way he treats God himself. Yeah, we, we learn how to live our life from Christ, and exactly, that's how it's going to be with, with in, a, in a household. The leader, the husband, needs to set the good example first, and to, to, to teach in that way, you know, what does the selfless love look like, and that just results in blessings from, from everyone in the family, you know, not just the husband and wife, but even the kids, you know, yeah. it's, it's a teaching, it's an example of, you know, how to carry out this, this leadership role, which results in loving and willful submission, too. Um, so yeah, so when when you know the husband and wife are both fulfilling their roles in a selfless way, you know, it can only go positively. It's only gonna be what God wants for us and, and it's gonna be blessed in the in those ways. I feel I feel well because it where I work and I see all the a lot of women, a lot of ladies there. And the thing I tell them all the time is that men have forgot how to how to love people, how to love women, and that's why women uh and a lot of times they're seeking that love so bad that they'll they grasp it in. Mm -hmm. and that's where man the men have really failed in this country anyways to say that because they don't know how to love like they should yeah so it's yeah it's awesome that we have god's god's words himself here telling us reminding us and so yeah it's something that we want to you know obviously not hide from people and you know this is god's word we get to share that and and you know hopefully lead other people to that too yeah all right marriage is for life Matthew 19, 6. Deborah, you want to read that one? Yes. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. Yeah. So God's design, once again, for marriage, it's for life. It's until death. Don't let any man separate it for any reasons whatsoever. Um, you know, in the book of Malachi, an Old Testament book of the prophet Malachi is speaking for God. And, and God says in that book, he hates divorce. It's, it, it can't be any clearer than that. That is what God says um, about divorce. You know, because anytime there is divorce, there's going to be sin involved somehow. Um, you know, obviously, there, we're going to look at some instances here where, where God says there's one person who is responsible for breaking the marriage vow. And, and still, there's still sin involved in that because you know, that the one person committed the sin to break the marriage bond. And so anytime there's a divorce, it's because sin has ruined God's gift of marriage in one way or another. And so Job, let's, yeah, then in Job, when uh, uh, the devil was before the Lord, and he told him that he could uh, do anything that Job he wants, and he couldn't take a life. It really, for a long time, it bugged me when Job was sitting in the ash pile, uh, scraping the uh, the royal doctor and his wife says, Oh, why don't you just curse God and die? And I thought to myself, Why did the devil take her? And he couldn't, yeah. because it's, the devil knows the word too. When he said he couldn't take his wife, that also meant his wife because he's one. Yeah, yeah, and God obviously is gonna is in control that is in control that he's gonna he's gonna work it out as he sees fit. Exactly. Yeah. All right, so let's look at those instances where um the two circumstances that, according to scripture, gives a person the right to obtain a, a divorce. The first one we're looking at is malicious desertion. 1 Corinthians 7 15. Dennis, go ahead and read that. But if the unbeliever leaves, let him do so. The believing man or woman is not bound in such circumstances. Though it's called, God has called us to live in peace. Yeah, so you notice what. God calls the person who is the first one to take the steps to leave a marriage, calls them an unbeliever. They're not acting as a believer anymore. They're leaving this marriage that, that they have entered in person. You know, this isn't just 
going on a little business trip or going out of town for a few weeks. This is talking about, you know, well, I mean, someone leaving the marriage bond. And, you know, one thing that falls under this umbrella of, you know, willingly deserting the marriage vow is, you know, something like abuse. You're obviously not acting in line with what God wants for marriage. You are breaking that vow by not living in that marriage vow as you should be anymore. And so it, it's those malicious desertion that, that um, abandoning your role in, in marriage is what this is talking about. And we also have adultery is the second reason why um, someone has, according to scripture, a right to obtain a divorce. Um, these passages are pretty black and white. They all just kind of repeat each other. So let's only read the first one, Matthew 19, 9. Freda, can you read that one for us? I tell you, you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for marriage and faithfulness, and marriage another woman, can be Yeah. So, you know, it's breaking the bond, you know, especially talking here about the sexual bond by creating that bond with someone else who isn't your spouse. Um, you know, and the, the, the marital unfaithfulness, the, the word in the Greek there is the word used for sexual immorality. It's talking about practicing sexual intimacy in a way that's unpleasing God. So when you take advantage of that gift by creating that bond with someone else who's not a part of your, your marriage, you break your bond that you had with your spouse. And that spouse who is wrong in that situation has the right to get a divorce because that other person has broken the bond already. All right, any questions there on divorce? All right. So now we're going to look at the role of man and woman more broadly than in marriage. Um, so yeah, we talked about the different roles specifically in marriage, but God makes a lot of parallels between the relationship of a husband and wife to you know the church family and how man and woman function in the church. And yes, once again, People have often misused these roles, um, but let's see what God tells us here about this. Um, so we must first of all agree that scripture is the final authority and then examine just what it is that scripture says. So once again, this is what God is telling us about these roles. So the Bible teaches an equal status before God. Men and women were equal before the fall into sin. God created both Adam and Eve in his own image. So we see right off the bat, God never said there is you know, a, a different... A different you know level before him they have different roles but they're equal before god and we also see they were equal after the fall into sin they both sinned both had fallen short before god just as they were equal in perfection they were also just as equal in sin number three through christ they continue to be equal he gave up his life for the sins of all people helen can you read that passage for us galatians 3 sure we were all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Yeah, so you see how many times this passage says, all, all of you are sons of God. All of you are baptized into Christ. You know, he says in that last verse, there is neither Jew nor Greek, so you know, no difference of nationality when it comes to perfection, no difference of social status, slave or free, um, both are perfect in God's sight when they have faith, male or female, no difference between gender when it comes to perfection. The only thing that matters with perfection is that Christ gives it to us. It doesn't matter who we are, what nationality, what social status, what gender, Christ made us perfect, and that is what God sees our perfection. We're all equal on that level. God has given different roles to these equal partners in creation. So we see that God created man first. And God's word says that when he did, he did this, he was demonstrating something. So let's look at this. Um, Genesis 2, we're not going to read that one. That's just what we read earlier, um, or, or what we've seen earlier. God formed man from the dust first. Um, so Adam was, was created first. So now 1 Timothy 2, verse 11 through 13. Um, Jacob, you want to read that one for us? A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over man. She must be silent for Adam when was born first. Day. Yeah, so let's look at this. Um, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. So this is saying the submission part, bring up that role of submission again. Understanding the man has the role of the leader. That's what God gave the man. And so the woman selflessly serves under him now. Um, and, you know, in quietness. This doesn't mean to not speak at all. It means, you know, speaking up in that, in a way that's going against leadership or trying to take leadership. 
God tells all people to proclaim Jesus and to sing psalms and hymns and to pray. So what, what Paul is saying here in this letter is saying, you know, women don't try to speak up and take leadership from, from men. That's because that's the role God has given to men. And in the second verse, this is one area where this Bible translation isn't great for this verse. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. Um, in the Greek, that, that phrase, or to have authority, is actually a participle. And participles aren't main verbs in a sentence, but they're modifying the main verb. And so the main verb here is saying, I do not permit a woman to teach, now bring in the modifier, in a way that has authority over men. Because in other parts of the Bible, we see Paul encouraging older women to teach younger women. But once again, it's it's the leadership aspect here. God gave the leadership role to men, and so women aren't supposed to, to, to teach men in a leadership role, because that's not what God gave, gave to them. And so we see, once again, she must be silent in regards to speaking up as a leader in those situations. And we see that Paul isn't saying this because it's, you know, what his own opinion is, but he brings up creation in the comparison here. He's, he's saying all this because Adam was formed first, then Eve. Adam was formed first as a leader, then Eve as the self of helper. Dennis. How do you explain Deborah? How do you explain Deborah? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, in that case, um, you know, men in, in that time in Israel's history, during so, so Deborah is a judge. Um, during the time in Israel's history, after Moses and Joshua, and before there were the kings, and so there were these judges who were rising up to serve as Israel's leaders. And typically, almost all of the judges were men, but we get this female judge, Deborah. And so the reason for that is because all of Israel's, you know, male leadership wasn't fulfilling their role as leader. And so we see it comes back to men failing to carry out their role first and foremost. That's where the failure is. And so we know that God is going to care for his people. And so he's he's teaching a lesson here by equipping Deborah to serve in that way and in a unique way in that situation because of the awful failures of what the, the leaders in Israel, the male leaders, should have been doing. And they weren't carrying out their role there. Yeah, Dennis. Yeah, well, we just read about the reader, neither man nor woman nor Greek nor Jew, but all flying Christ Jesus. It also ties in with Philippians 4 13, where it says, I can do all things for Christ Jesus strengthens me. That doesn't just mean men. That means everyone. If we say that women can't teach or take an authoritative role in the, in the, in the, in the presence of the likes where the neither man nor woman nor Greek nor Jew, but all women Christ Jesus says that applies to her too, not just man. Yeah. And so and Deborah's the example of that. Yeah. Deborah Deborah's more of an exception because the men weren't supposed to be doing their roles. They, or they, they weren't fulfilling, fulfilling their roles as they should have. You know, in the perfect world, everyone's going to do their role perfectly, obviously, right? And so in the perfect world that, that Christ has designed here with these, these roles that he has given us, it's going to be the men stepping up and taking those leadership roles because that is what God wants them to do, like Christ leads the church. And um, and so obviously with, with Deborah, you know, an exception like that, she had to step up because of the failures. And so, you know, obviously, might there be times when there are failures, our male leaders? Yeah. You know, but that doesn't mean the first step a woman wants to take is to just jump for, jump for that leadership role and say, I'm going to take over. You know, the first step as a selfless, you know, helper is to, to help that leader and to equip them and to, you know, say, I want you to fulfill your role the best that you can. So I'm going to help you. And, and support you to, to fulfill that role selflessly. In Genesis chapter 3, when God was laying down what was going to happen to man and woman because of their sin, one of the things that, that God said is that the woman's desire will be her husband. Mm -hmm. What was he saying? No, oh, she not love you. No, she wants him as well. Yeah. That's yeah. what she, mm -hmm. so it's the sinful part of her wants to be in charge. Yeah. That's yeah. what that was saying. Yeah, and it can be, yeah, it can be the other way too. Men can fail too. They might not want to take up the leadership role as they should too and, and put the woman in a tough spot where they have to, you know, to, to deal with that now as a result of that failure. Yeah. All right. We also have 1 Timothy 3 verse 1 here talking about this. Um, Jacob, did you just read? Yeah, I read. Uh, okay. Yeah, well, well that's Sylvester, can you read that one, 1 Timothy 3? Here is a trustworthy saying. If anyone set his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. Now the overseer must be above the reproach of the husband of the one woman. Yeah. And so we, in First Timothy, Paul is talking about um, men serving as spiritual leaders in the church. 
And so we see when he talk when he brings up the idea of you know an overseer, a uh, spiritual leader, he says the husband about one wife. He doesn't say the wife about one husband. You know, he's he's clearly talking about in these leadership sections sections using male pronouns and, and male words to talk about how the husband is going to lead in these roles, um, and that he's supposed to be the spiritual leader in in those parts. Once again, not saying that he is better or that the leadership role is better. You need both leaders and supporters. Think of how hard it is for someone to lead when supporters aren't following along. You know, it's it a, a leader can't get anything done when you know um, supporters aren't supporting well and carrying out their supporting. And so you need both of those roles working together in, in tandem to create something productive. Um, all right, any questions through that point there? I guess the Mormons only have some issues to deal with. <laughs> Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Just a couple, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So creation was not complete without woman. And everything else God saw, and sorry, and everything else, God saw that it was good or complete, but man was not complete. Um, we read this passage earlier. God said it's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. So God wasn't satisfied with just man. It was always his plan to make woman too. And, and that shows us that was equal in his sight. He was always planning it. And God once again created them with specific roles. First Corinthians 11, 3 and 8 through 9. Um, Cassandra, Cassandra is gone. So Marilyn, can you take that one for us? Now I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman from man. Yeah, so we see that, you know, it's it's we see the leadership roles here. Christ is the head of man, and man is the head of the woman. So man is also under Christ and wants to imitate Christ when he serves as the head of woman. Um, yeah. I just wanted to think we need to really make it clear, too, that we're talking about husband and wife, not every man over every woman. Well, some of these passages we looked at, it has been outside of that that role of head of, of just in a marriage. Um, like the, the first Timothy passage we looked at earlier, you know, that's expanding it out past just um, a, a married relationship. It's showing in the church this is how these roles are also carried out um, beyond a marriage relationship. And he parallels that 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 saying, um, he compares that man and woman relationship to, to how it's carried out in the church with leadership too, um, with the overseers saying, he's saying men are serving as the overseers in the church, where, you know, a man's not the husband of every wife or every woman in the church, but he's serving as the overseer in the church. And he sets the example um, of being a selfless leader by having one wife. Um, I guess, yeah. And so in this passage, um, yeah, he, he's bringing it to talk about men and women in general, Just going back to Adam and Eve too, saying man didn't come from woman, but woman for man. And, you know, man wasn't created for woman, but woman for man. Um, just in general. And that, that is getting more narrow at the marriage. But do you see, I guess, what I'm, I'm saying? So I'm not trying to confuse you. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so this was an intimate relationship of interdependence. Um, woman was taken from a bone, right, from a man. They are meant to exist together in a close relationship. Um, so each role has blessings and challenges. Um, leadership has the responsibility of being in charge. That's not always going to be an easy role to carry out. So the wife and, or the woman sometimes has to follow. That's not always easy to, to do, to put yourself aside to follow. Um, you know, going back to comparing it with uh, a marriage relationship, you know, the mother has a special bond with a child that the father can never have. Um, just by nature, the mother bears the child and, and you see throughout growth of that child, it's um, it always has a special relationship with the mother that the father might not ever have. And so that's a blessing that the role of woman can get in, in that marriage relationship that the father would never have. And, you know, it would be foolish for a husband to make a decision without the wife and without any input from her. Um, I heard an example of comparing this, um, comparing husband and wife to a man or a, me, a pitcher and catcher. Um, obviously the pitcher in baseball is the one who ends up throwing the pitch. She does the action, but you know, what about all that time beforehand in practice where the pitcher and catcher were talking to each other, making game plans in the game, the pitcher, the catcher uses signals to, to communicate with the pitcher and to help make that decision of what pitch are we going to throw? And so 
that's how we picture this. It's not um, any less important. There's talking and there's you know discussion that goes on in this relationship. But then, um, but then you know the husband is one who takes the action, who takes the lead role in that um, in that position. So Christ also had a distinct role in relation to God the Father. They are equal in power and majesty. Jesus assumed a role, that, and that role was to become human and to give himself for the sins of the whole world. Kathy, go ahead. Instead of being in very nature, God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human life. Yeah, so once again, we see the greater glory for Jesus was to come in submission to the Father's will, to submit himself to the will. And so that's an example of how you know, um, wives can show that that glory to that same glory in their submission, selfless, selfless supporting and following of their husbands too. All right. So man is to carry out that role and that that role relationship in love and without a serving. Jeez, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm reading off right now. Man is to carry out that role relationship in love and with a serving attitude. The Bible clearly tells the man to love his wife. It doesn't tell him to force her to submit. It speaks to his weakness. Treat your wife with love and concern, even as Christ loved the church. When that role is carried out properly, it becomes very easy for the woman to carry out her role. So this is speaking back to what you were saying earlier, Dennis. When the man carries out his leadership role, it it, it fosters that environment of wanting to serve in selfless, submissive love, too. And it starts with you know demonstrating that in the role. So the role of relationship clearly applies to church life too. So I guess these, these are going to talk about some passages here too, Dennis, where it broadens it out past just man or husband and wife, but to man and woman um, in the church. Um, 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 13. Deborah, can you read that one for us? Yes. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She must be silent. But Adam was formed first, then he. Yeah, so going back to that passage once again, we read it earlier. Paul is using the example of Adam and Eve, how they were created, Adam first, then Eve, to demonstrate in the church. This is how the roles of men and women should be carried out. Women um, submitting selfless service to, to the man and not trying to teach in an authoritative way over other men. And 1 Corinthians 14, 33 through 36. I'll read this one and break it up a little bit as we go. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. So obviously God is a God who's going to do things for a good thing, for unity. As in all the congregations of the saints, women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission as the law says. So, you know, see the contrast there. The contrast is speak versus be in submission. So the Bible, once again, tells all people to sing and to tell about Jesus and to proclaim praises. So we obviously don't go to church and say only the men can say the responses and only the men can sing the hymn. But the, the, the point is, is bringing up leadership here again, to not speak in a way that is um, rebelling against the role of submissive helper um, and, and not in a way that kicks man out of his role of leader. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Did the word of God originate with you or are you the only people it has reached? Um, so yeah, and Paul finishes the section by saying, you know, did, did you make these rules up? Did I make these rules up? No, I didn't make up these rules that God gives to us. God is the one who has told us these rules in his word. And that's why we follow it now too. All right. So, you know, how is this reflected in our church today? Um, we see with, with pastors, we see that the spiritual leader, the spiritual head is going to be a man. Um, and are there women who might be better public speakers and might be able to deliver a message better? Sure, there are. But, you know, that's not the role that God has given to, to women. Um, it's not for us to say, you know, um, that God is wrong here and that, you know, women should be the, the spiritual leaders. Um, you know, we don't go against what God says. And that'd be the same thing for the men, too. If, if, not, if no men um, hypothetically wanted to serve as a spiritual leader, you know, they're going against what the role that God wants wants them to fulfill. And so we see that God wants us to fulfill both of these roles um, in the church as well, too. All right. Um, I'm not sure about other Lutheran churches. We're a, a, so there's other Lutheran denominations, and so we're the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod, is what our church is affiliated with. And in our church body, there are no women preachers. 
um, because we take God's role of what he says for, for men to be the leader. And, you know, we apply, that's how we apply it and say um, that being a pastor is a spiritual leadership role. And we're going to have that leader be the man as Christ has described us in the Bible. Dennis? Going back to the other scripture, do you, uh, <clears throat> said, do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. Mm -hmm. It says man. It doesn't say men. You said men. I did say men? Yes, you did. And study the... Well, I don't know if I should be interfering in this. Um, okay. Back to you. Uh, sure, yeah. Well, we'll talk about it. And if I okay. can't get you a great answer, I'll look at the Jewish tradition and it's still today. Mm -hmm. Men sat yeah. on one side, women sat on the other side. Yeah. And what was going on during when Paul was talking about this, the women would stand up during the service and ask her husband, what does that mean? And that was disrupting the service. And he was saying, don't do that. That's what that was talking about. Okay. That's what I was taught when I went to college. Yeah. Um, I'd have to look closer in, into that specifically about the asking the husband at home. Um, I, I guess going to the, so first I'll just look at the, the first Timothy 2, 12 verse that you were pointing out. The, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. Um, not men, but a man. Yes. And it says a man. No, yeah. And so, it, men. you know, if, if Paul was talking about in that verse, um, specifically a husband and a wife, a lot of times when he says that, um, you know, he'd give a, uh, a lot of times when he uses that, he gives like a director or like a like to her, her man, her husband. Um, you know, speaking generally, I do not permit a woman, generally any woman, to to teach or to teach in an authoritative way um over a man. So just a man in general. Um so I think he's just talking like collectively, like any man, any woman, um, in that case. But I'd have to look more into the I'm not trying to disrupt yeah. Yeah. I have to look more yeah. into it. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, totally okay. It's, it makes makes me a better teacher. I get to learn learn from this week. Um and so yeah, the, the other passage though about um speaking to their own husbands at home, I'd have to look into that more because obviously, you know, every woman doesn't have a husband. Um yeah, so my yeah, I have to look into that more. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah. <laughs> All right, any other questions on chapter 10 here, roles of men and women? All right, sorry I took two minutes of your time extra. Let's, okay. let's close the prayer though before we head out. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us into your word again to, to study what you tell us tonight about the roles of man and woman and husband and wife. Um, please help us to, to grow in our faith and to let these truths be planted at home in our hearts and give us all safe travel as we head our own separate ways tonight. In your name we pray, amen.